Good afternoon and welcome to Starboard Consulting's webinar. Today is Thursday, February 11th, and you are with the webinar Implementing Maximo in an Agile Environment. I'd like to turn it over to today's moderator, Lonnie Trotter. Lonnie, welcome. Thank you, Alex, and welcome everyone uh, in attendance today, and thank you for joining. Before we get into our topic, Maximum in an Agile Environment, I want to tell you a little bit about Starboard Consulting. So we are an IBM Gold business partner. What that means is that we've been a business partner that uh, has certified uh, implementers, certified developers, certified functional analysts, and we've been there for about 14 years. We do everything Maximo. We implement brand new Maximo systems. We upgrade them. We do end user training, uh, build integrations to external systems, um, and uh, take Maximo to the mobile environment. It has something to do with Maximo, we do it. Um, so that's what I, that's a little bit of background on Starboard. Today, uh, we want to share some things that we uh, have learned in our Maximo implementations. Uh, primarily um, around Agile methodologies. We've got a great group of people to talk about that topic with us today, too. Today, we have myself, Lonnie Trotter. I am a, a Maximo consultant. I've been with uh, Starboard for nine years and implementing IT projects for uh, over 20. Um, Amy Terry, she is a senior project manager with Starboard. She is a certified project management professional, and an Agile certified practitioner. Amy has been with Starboard for nine and a half years and managing IT projects for over 18 years. Next, we have Tony Sanchez, a senior project manager managing IT projects for over 15 years in all sorts of industries, including large multinational companies, all the way down to smaller companies. We also have Carolyn Dar, a certified project manager, also certified Six Sigma Greenbelt, and Agile Scrum Master. Carolyn has over 15 years managing software and hardware projects. Thank you all. The, thanks to the panel for being here today. Such talented people. Really exciting to hear uh, what this amazing group is going to have to share. But before we get started, Alex, would you mind uh, starting one of us out with a poll question? Yeah, thanks, Lonnie, and welcome all. So we noticed there's a lot of different backgrounds and, and different organizations. So we would love to hear from you if you look in your chat window and answer the poll. Did you come to the session not knowing exactly what you wanted to learn? Um, yes, no, we, we just love to see. Um, and if you have anything specific you are interested in learning, you can enter that in the chat box as well. Looks like half and half right now. Thanks. Well, we'll go ahead and close the poll, but if you want to add anything additional, we'd love to hear from you in the chat window. Thanks so much. That's great. Thanks, Alex. We do have about a half and half. Uh, some some kind of knew what they wanted to learn today and some didn't. And of course, learning is what life is all about, isn't it? So glad to have everyone here. In light of all that, Amy, um, what are some of the takeaways that, that our attendees can expect from, or what, what do we hope to have them take away from our webinar today? Well, thanks, Lonnie, and thanks for everybody who was able to join us today on this webinar. Um, so our webinar is a bit unique today. Usually our Starboard webinars are we, more Maximo specific features, functionalities, upgrades, new releases. We often have our tech folks on here talking. Um, today you got the much more extroverted PMs on here. Um, <laughs> so today might be a little different for you. We're gonna be talking about how you're, we're gonna be talking about your Maximo projects and Agile and share what we've experienced over the years. Um, our goal today in this webinar is to have you guys go home with three main takeaways. First, how your team can apply Agile concepts to your Maximo projects and implementations. Why would you apply an iterative and incremental approach to your Maximo projects? And lastly, when would you want to use an Agile approach in your Maximo? Um, so I guess to start off, since you guys were kind of half and half on what Agile is, and if you know what it was, you know, know what it was before you got here, 
Carolyn, why don't you give us some background on what Agile is at a high level and teach us a little Agile 101. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. Thanks, Amy. Um, so if anyone's ever Googled Agile or researched it, I'm sure you've gotten uh, a lot of information, passionate discussions about what it is, what it's not, uh, a lot of terminology as well. You'll hear user stories and story points and even manifestos. Um, but what is Agile really? Um, it is a methodology. It's not necessarily a tool. It's not an exact science. Uh, it's an approach on how your software development teams are going to execute and deliver a project and software deliveries. So I've done a comparison with my family here at home on, they ask what I do um, and, and why Agile is, is such a popular uh, phase of, of what we do here. And I tell them it's similar to if how you execute housework. Um, if you have to dust and vacuum, you can dust, and dust the whole house and then vacuum the whole house. Uh, or you can dust a room and vacuum the room and then go to the next room, dust it, vacuum, dust it until you finish the whole, all the rooms in the house. Two different approaches. One's not necessarily better than the other, but they're just two different ways of, of executing and getting to the goal of having a clean house. So uh, one's not necessarily, you know, more popular than the other, but Agile, we seem to, to have a, a lot of positive uh, and executions around. So Agile is iterative. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Iterative are, are tight cycles. Uh, so um, cycles of work. So you'll hear, uh, we use the terminology sprints as well. So same thing as an iteration. Um, and most of the time in my previous life, our sprints and iterations are between two and four weeks. Uh, so those are tight, tight timelines. They're time boxed um, so that we can get through quickly small amounts of scope, uh, a small timeline to, to finish it and test it. And then we have that opportunity to accept feedback and change and see if there's anything that we need to improve upon. Or, or as far as change is concerned, uh, we can accept that change um, and put it into our next iteration or our next sprint. Versus waterfall, uh, waterfall you'll see instead of the this loop of requirements and design and development, it's more linear like a waterfall. Uh, so I have seen weeks and sometimes even months uh, requirements um, being gathered and then approved and then weeks and even more months uh, to develop those requirements. Again, weeks and more months to test it. That's a lot of weeks and months to, for your stakeholders and end users to finally see that all the hard work that everyone's done and to see that output. Um, and then of course, what happens is there's some little tweaks that need to happen or changes as well because so much time has elapsed. So Agile's not that. Agile's more iterative and very tight. Um, and ha we have those feedback loop loops often. So you see, Whenever you, you pull up Agile, I'm sure you'll always see these graphics that are very circular and iterative like that. Um, <clears throat> takeaway from, from that is, if, if anything, uh, takeaway that Agile is iterative and incremental. So we take small, smaller um, chunks of requirements, iterate, test. Um, again, another set of uh, functionality, iterate, test, another smaller set until we have uh, the feature set that we need. Um, so the uh, deliver often and deliver early is definitely the foundation of Agile. So just a couple of principles as well. Um, with Agile, we want to satisfy the customer and the client, your end users early and continuous. Uh, we welcome change. Uh, waterfall, not so much. It just takes long to incorporate new change. In Agile, we, that's a principle. We welcome change. Um, and we also encourage uh, continuous feedback and retrospectives, um, which increases our productivity as well. So um, again, different approaches to executing the same game here. And what you'll find for organizations I've seen that are transforming into that cult and agile culture, you'll see where 
they'll take successful components from their waterfall and incorporate it with some some uh, easy uh, capabilities from Agile and, and merge those two to get started into that transformation. And I think, Tony, I think you have um, ha have lived through examples of that type of hybrid <laughs> approach. Can you walk through some some specific scenarios? Sure, sure, no, absolutely. Um, what I what I like about um, what we're doing here today, right? So there's like 32 people here. Um, a lot of folks, I think, may have been told, "Hey, this is." something that's important, it's agile. Uh, or maybe your boss has said, hey, we should be agile. And the truth is, I'm not sure that people have a really clear definition of what that actually means, right? So a lot of people will go and like Carolyn said, they'll Google it and then they get more confused and then they'll go to something else and their bosses are saying, but we have to be agile because they have to put that on their documentation to the executive board. Well, we're an agile you know, corporation now. Um, so having said that, I think what's important is um, Again, that hybrid approach is really something that I think everybody in this world has has used. Some of us have done absolute hardcore uh, agile methodologies. Others have done that at uh, the waterfall. The hybrid approach really works very well. And I like to use this analogy and, and my team's gonna roll their eyes because I say it all the time. But it's all about um, in life, not biting off more than you can chew. At the end of the day, if you take a big bite, you choke on it. Sometimes you can't digest it properly, right? The hybrid approach is exactly the same thing. That's really what, what Agile is all about, is taking off these small bites and digesting those bites, right? So, so one of the examples I want to give is, you know, you can use that Agile methodology all the way down to the development cycle of how that software is being developed, which is obviously what part of the definition is. But in this hybrid approach, one way to look at it is from a bit more of a macro level. Um, I have a, a university that's one of our clients. Uh, and right now they use uh, Maximo in their main campus, okay? There's conversations about rolling out Maximo to all of their satellite campuses, which is about 25 different campuses. Now, if you think about the way that would work in a, in a traditional waterfall methodology, you would sit there and you would go through and figure out and map out all of your uh, requirements for every single campus. Now, these campuses are all very different and, very, and, and, and run, run very uniquely. Now this can also, you know, apply to not just a school. It could be, you know, a business. You know, you know, rolling out new software to to various business units. The idea is, in in a waterfall world, you're starting and putting together this massive project. You roll it out with hopes that you've captured everything. The beauty of of, of hybrid approach and the beauty of what we do with agile is that we can take of these 25 campuses. Let's take the first five. Okay. And we'll, we'll bite that smaller piece off. We'll spend the time to understand and learn what those five campuses need and we can roll out. We'll roll out five campuses. That rollout in itself is now going to be the benchmark for how we're going to move forward. And back to Carolyn's point about iterative, we're going to learn from that because in those five, we may have gotten, you know, 85% of it right, but there's 15% that had to be adjusted. Not to mention that that model that you just used is something that you're going to use as a foundation. So from a from a cost perspective, and this is where it gets a little loaded, but from a cost perspective, now you have a good template to take that forward to your next to your next rollout. And so so people, I think, sometimes get really tied up and really kind of lost in definitions and and methodologies and why should it be done this way. When the reality is, if you just take off these smaller pieces, right, go after them, have success, and then build on that success. You're, you're able to, to develop and, and produce a much better product at the end. Now, again, in, in, in certain situations, that doesn't work. Right? There, there are situations where you, know, you, you have a very tight timeline and Agile is the only way to go. There could be components that are uh, of Agile that are gonna be used in that smaller bite that you took, okay? So people are probably you know, spinning their heads saying, Tony, what are you talking about? It's, you know, you know my, my, my theming really is that it's an approach that can be used at a very high macro level and all the way down to those user stories. Because, you know, Carolyn mentioned earlier, people talk about sprints, they talk about user stories. That is agile. Taking 25 campuses and splitting them down to two or three at a time, that's also agile, right? It's, it, you know, it's all what you make of it. Um, and and that, that approach of, of, I call it, you know, a rinse and repeat. Once you do it once successfully, now think about, you know, the senior leaders that are now seeing, um, back to my example, Right now, you get the senior leaders at this university seeing success and there's and, and they're seeing the fruits of what they made a decision on. You know, this company slash university has invested some some real dollars to, to, to 
roll this software out. They're going to have to wait 18 months before they see anything versus perhaps waiting three months to see those first five campuses. Right away, there's that ROI. Okay. And again, you can apply that methodology, you can apply that, that thinking to, to, to a corporate structure as well. It's the same thing. Those CFOs and the CEOs love seeing return right away. And all of a sudden, you've got people that are working in a more efficient manner, getting things done in a better way, um, faster by using these methodologies. So again, don't don't allow yourself to get too hung up on on terminology. Um, I think when while Google is a, a wonderful tool and there's a lot of information out there, I think it can be very overwhelming. Um, another big piece of it is to how, how does it apply to your organization and what it is that you're trying to accomplish? Because in some cases, um, I worked for organizations that were 150,000 you know associates. Um, I worked for some that are 25 associates. Um, in that 150,000 associate pool, you might have the ability to have a team of 10 or 15 people on the technology side and 10 or 15 people from the business side that are 100% dedicated to this project, okay? That's a luxury that not a lot of companies have. So in traditional agile methodologies, you need to have people that are 100% dedicated to a project, okay? The minute you say that, a lot of people on this meeting are like, well, I can't do that. My job, I wear you know 10 different hats. How could I possibly do that? That's why the hybrid approach works so well. That's something that you can really do. And I see my team members doing a lot of head bobbing, right? Because a lot of us do it daily when you're asking for feedback and you're asking for your, you know, your clients to, to contribute. There's an understanding that this is not their full-time job. And if it is, great. Not too often does that actually happen. So that's kind of my example. It was it, it's more of a macro level, you know, you know, ideals around what agile can be. Um, you know, I believe that Amy might have some other, you know, uh, examples to kind of bring us that might be a bit more uh, at the micro level um, and a bit more specific. Uh, but hopefully that kind of gives you a, a vision of where my head's at and kind of how we apply things here at Starboard. Amy, over to you. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so as Tony was saying, he talked about kind of some larger implementations that, where we can implement Agile. And I'm going to give you some examples of other ways we can use Agile in Maximo projects. Um, so one example that uh, worked really well for us, I was working with a client who had a, they were an IT department. So their user community, which is very disenchanted regarding Maximo. Um, the client had a very stable environment. They were regularly upgraded. Um, so mostly they were just looking at that point to do enhancements. Well, their process was the same kind of process we see in so many companies where, you know, people would send in, I want this, I want this, I want this. They'd have this big list, this big backlog. And finally, when it just got so big, they couldn't deal with it anymore. They would say, okay, we're going to make this a project. Um, so you've got the people who were very initially putting that together, you know, the first couple of people who maybe submitted their request, by the time they finally get that developed and go through requirements and get it in production, a year or more has passed. Um, so that was the, hence the disenchantment with Maximo and it was getting a lot of, a lot of flack for it. So that's where we came in and said, okay, I think the best thing we need to do is we need to, you know, implement an agile approach. Now, as Tony said, it's very hard to get an, a team completely devoted to a project. I mean, for lack of a better term, we're kind of the, you know, the Maximum Projects are kind of like their side hustle job while they're doing their, their real job. So not having that, we knew we were going to have to have some flexibility, which luckily Agile allows for as well. Um, so what we did, instead of taking these big projects with these you know, this big backlog, we said, okay, let's, let's take small chunks. Let's take some low hanging fruit. Let's get these pieces and let's just get them out the door quicker. And we were able to do that by going through, you know, we would, some sprints would have tons of small enhancements. The next one might only have, you know, five enhancements because they were rather large, but the user community was just so happy because they were continually getting stuff. And even, if they didn't get exactly what they wanted and they knew maybe theirs was three spins down the road, they were still seeing that outcome. And so from an executive level down, there was just a lot more happiness in the way that they were getting feedback for Maximo and getting things done. So this was really kind of a, a hybrid approach, you know, because of the devoted team and all. And so we did create user stories. We developed enhancements and an iterative approach. The way it would work there, we would go about every six weeks. Um, I know Carolyn talked about most sprints are a little shorter, but again, we were we were doing a hybrid approach. 
So we would go about every six weeks, we'd roll out new functionality. We'd take two or three weeks to stabilize, work through lessons learned, um, plan for the next sprint. And then because the user community started seeing these results and all, they were like, they were just on board with it. We just kept going with the sprints um, and, and, you know, kept this process going. So you can use the same approach for upgrades. And, you know, you can, a lot of times upgrades bring you new opportunities or new enhancements, functionality, you know, desire to change your business processes. But you can use an agile framework in that way too. Often we have clients that they've decided to do an upgrade, but then they have all these other needs. And so again, it becomes a big project. And we found that if we can go ahead and just make the first sprint, the upgrade, just a plain upgrade without any like for like technical upgrade with no use of any new functionality, no change to business processes, just like for like, then while that is being done by the technical side, we can be working with the functional side, getting the user stories, having the planning go, and so that as soon as that upgrade is in and stabilized, we can start a sprint and get some enhancements done. Um, so this is just, you know, a couple of examples for utilizing uh, Agile and Maximo, but the, you know, the point is to get it done faster. And a lot of times that's kind of a mis, uh, misunderstanding with, with Agile, I guess you could say, because people think, well, I want it faster. You don't get as much. So if you have a list of 75 items you need, if you say I'm going to do it Agile, you're not going to get all 75 faster. It doesn't work like that. But you can get small bits and pieces, even if over the course of the time you get the 70. At the end of the day, you may get them in the same time frame, but you get you have those quicker wins throughout the throughout the process. Um, so I guess one of the things I, I kind of got a little bit distracted by one of the questions I saw in here, um, and I just kind of wanted to bring it up since we were, I know we're not to questions yet, but I know somebody asked about whether or not you can, um, how you would work with agile while also doing it with GIS, um, because, or any kind of an, you know, we're usually connected to a GIS or some kind, you know, maybe Oracle or Oracle financials or something. So that is something that. You know, we do we do hit that. We do address that. So I'm not I'm going to actually let, you know, Carolyn and I, have, Carolyn, Tony and I have been doing a lot of talking about Maximo and Agile from a project manager perspective. Um, but we also have in here with us is Lonnie Trotter that you guys heard from at the very beginning. She's one of our senior functional leads. And I'd like Lonnie to share kind of her perspective of Magi and you know, Maximo with Agile projects from a more boots on the ground perspective. And then also Lonnie. If you could, maybe while you're in that, could you kind of address some of the you know projects we've done where we did have interfaces as part of it and go through that? Certainly. 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 Thanks, Amy. The your your explanation of the of the hybrid approaches and how Maximo is a good um, environment for this kind of activity it leads right into the examples that I had in mind. So. I have a lot of life, real life experience with, with some of this thing, with some of the delivering some of these kinds of projects uh, to the users, uh, all the way from the gathering of the requirements all the way through, you know, testing and delivery. So what I'd like to offer is three um, maximal, maximal projects that are just ripe for this kind of, of hy hybrid or agile approach, right? The whole idea about agile is we are moving. Agility is movement and successful movement without falling down, right? So that's how I like to look at it. So number one, the, the, the enhancements wish list. There is not a Maximo uh, customer that I know who doesn't have a list of things that people have been asking for. Uh, you know, users are constantly, I wish Maximo would do this. It would be better if Maximo did it this way. Um, you know, can it look, can it look better? So many, and every client you talk to has got a barrel full of these. So what I like to think about these wish lists as targeted outcomes. So you take this 75 enhancements that people have been watching, uh, wishing for, you you digest them and consolidate them and synthesize them into categories. So you're going to be saying work order improvements, workflow improvements, business process improvements. So you're going to start seeing common themes. So you target, you take one of those common things and you carve those enhancements that meet that into a sprint 
for example, or into a targeted um, mini project that you can do that that development on. Uh, you're gonna gonna go to the users. You're gonna make sure that you understand the requirements, just like you would anyway, and you're gonna be able to develop those quickly and get quick user feedback. So again, to Carolyn's point on the iter iterative uh, nature of Agile, once you get that in, those enhancements come to life in Maximo, then you can say, okay, how can we make it better? Or would this does this fit the bill? And then you, you can release it like now. So the idea is if you target these um, enhancements and our wish list, then you can deliver often and deliver early. So that's one. The second category I wanted to talk about was we have customers who want to uh, implement uh, a new business process. Let's say they've never done inspections before. They do, they're doing PMs, they're doing regular, you know, repair work, repair work and things of that nature, but they've never really done an inspection program. So then we, we need to start, right? And that's very targeted. Um, yes, it has to do with work orders. Yes, it has to do with assets. But the idea is that you can do this in a microcosm where you can design that, that just that one business process get from, from inspection design to inspection delivery in a short period of time. So that's another one. Sometimes it even involves creating brand new applications for uh, the customer. But meanwhile, all the other applications are, um, you know, trucking along just like they normally would. So that's another one. That's kind of a hopes and dreams fulfilled kind of a, kind of a, of a scenario. Uh, the third idea that probably, you know, kind of makes people, It'll take a deep breath is that many organizations need help with standardizing um, their data and standardizing their work processes. So any kind of Maximo data standardization and optimization project can be done on an agile basis, right? Same thing. You're targeting the data sets first. Tackle the data sets that are most foundational. Tackle those. Get those standardized. Get rules written for them optimize what you already have, and then enforce what any new data coming in meets the standard. So um, that can be done iteratively. Do the foundational ones, build on, on top of that. You may start with locations. You're going to build on top of that with uh, classifications. You're going to build on top of that with assets and their and their attributions. Um, and, and then before you know it, you've got optimized data, not, not before you know it in terms of a timeline duration, but you can see that one thing builds on another and constant improvement is happening. So I've probably taken more time than you uh, wanted me to, Amy, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I will go on and say, uh, I will go on and say in terms of the agile development along with a, an interface uh, s similar to GIS, it takes a lot of cooperation and coordination. Um, there is no doubt about it that that is a parallel two systems that are doing things that, and we need to keep up with one another because we are sharing those records and we are, um, you know, taking outages and making changes. And it just, it's just, there's only one word I can think of. It does take quite a bit of coordination. So, and I think communication, Lonnie, would be the other word, probably. Absolutely, communication. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think that's where, if I could just jump in on that, you know, that's where having daily stand ups, which are typically part of an agile process, is very helpful because you don't go very long without having these conversations and communication. Of course, in any project is the key, just as it is with agile. But I think that, you know, that would help. But we, we, we have done it with, you know, We've, got, we've done it with a SAP implementations, Oracle implementations, you know, it, it, with the interfaces to many of these other other projects going on on the external side. You know, yeah, and, and I want to jump in here too quick. I think what's, what's really important, it was such a great thing about Agile and, and all the pieces that we're talking about here is that ability to kind of, you know, correct the course of the ship. Because when you're sitting in a room with different people, you've got the business on one side, you've got technology on the other side, whether it's consultants and clients, it doesn't really matter who it is. What one person's vision and how they're describing it versus how somebody's receiving that can sometimes be off. We all know this. It happens in, in any situation, whether it's at home or at work, right? Um, and what's beautiful about the agile you know, you know, methodologies and, and, and doing that iterative design and delivering is that when you go to deliver, you know, Lonnie made the point earlier, you deliver it, you show it, you say, okay, now let's improve on it. Because now at least they're going to get something where in, in, the, in the other traditional methodologies, they're waiting until the very end. And now they're in user acceptance testing and they're testing and they go, well, wait a minute, I didn't ask for this necessarily. So with Agile, you have that, <clears throat> excuse me, had the opportunity to, to revisit and to kind of course correct things along the way. 
Um, so, you know, and, and then also, you know, Amy said a great thing. She said it earlier, she says, agile does not mean faster. It, it, it doesn't mean faster. It means a different approach, but you can sell it almost as being faster because you do wind up having something tangible to give to your senior, to, to, to your senior staff, to give to your users, to give to people that they can actually touch it, right? Use it, it feel is it. more frequent and more frequently. Yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and very frequent. So while it's not actually delivering those 75 thingies that she mentioned earlier quicker, people are getting their hands on it sooner, keeping them busy. They're going through it. They're understanding it, giving you feedback so that you're delivering a better product at the end. Um, and, and, and it does feel quicker, which I think is really important. It does. Which is why all, does. all the senior executives love it because they can they get their hands on it sooner, right? Yeah, it does. One. Can I add and more money. color to that? Go yeah. for it. Um, so when organizations are introduced to uh, Agile and, and wanting to, uh, they they initially always believe that Agile does mean quicker. And when I say people, I really do mean management. <laughs> they want to introduce it because it's quicker. Um, but to Tony's point, um, it's not necessarily faster, but what it is is that it brings speedy delivery of business value. Mm -hmm. So you'll see those quick wins, as Amy was saying, and uh, those quick ROIs, you can start seeing those quicker. Um, so now with the whole project and the timeline be faster than a waterfall timeline, that's up for, nego you know, those are up for passionate discussions, which we can have um, mm -hmm. maybe offline, but it is speedy delivery of business value. That's what Absolutely. is quick. Absolutely. Yeah. So Alex, I, mean, I think we I think we're running close to time or Yeah, for a poll question. Yeah, you're doing great. Great. And those are great descriptions as well. With that said, with some of those, we'd love to hear again from from you in the audience. Um who's using or has used agile methodologies in your Maximo projects? Um, we'd love a quick yes or no if you've adopted the, the agile methodology. Yeah, if there's you're a thinking poll. about it. Feel free to to enter that in the chat box as well. Looks like and about sixty percent have used agile methodologies, which it is does. Great. Lonnie, before we before we move on to open up questions, there's one point I kind of thought all about. Right, thank that, you all. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it looks like we've got several people. Are it looks like what thirty eight percent have, sixty one have not. So I think this is a good point. So we like agile. I mean, we like waterfall. We you know we we do it all. Um, sometimes management prefers one or the other. But I will tell you who really does like agile, and Lonnie, you can probably attest to this, is developers. They do. Um, tell. Why don't you explain the difference between handing someone a forty five page functional requirement document and a user story? <laughs> Oh, good point. I didn't mention the user story. So, um, you know that in a traditional um, big bang project, sometimes we like to call them where we spend time uh, gathering requirements for a long time, then we spend a long time developing it, and then we come back and say, oh, you remember what you asked for? Well, here it is. And number one, most people don't remember what they asked for. Um, and then the developers, and then you come back to the developer after that and say, well, you know, this is, they would like to change this. So the idea of, of be able to develop something that has a, a targeted outcome. We can see it right then and the users say yes and they maybe make a small tweak to it as opposed to coming back and say, well, we decide our business process is going to be way different now because we just like Maximo so much that we're going to make, you know, some changes. So by the time we get back to the developer, he's almost, he or she may be redoing a lot, a lot of work. So the iterative value of development or delivery uh, tends to stick uh, better because it's recent people remember and then they go and start using it because you've delivered it to them. So there's uh, there's lots of advantages to that all the way around. Definitely. Very cool. Thanks, Lonnie. Sorry, I had to hit you, throw you back on the hook there. No, so that's I a good one. That that's a really good yeah, one. I actually want to... I want to comment on the 38% and 61%. So, you know, there, there, there's a handful of newbies that are in the crowd uh, when it comes to Agile. But here's the thing that, here, here's my observation. So, you know, Maximo is a you know, product that's been around for how long? Like 20 plus years. So it is a, a piece of software. IBM has been around for a very long time. So a lot of people that are have been developing and working in, in Maximo had been more traditional. Where if this was a, a, a webinar and the software was, some sort of mobile app development, I'd be willing to bet that almost everybody there had been doing, you know, uh, agile all along because it's a very new way 
uh, of doing things. So, so applying a newer methodology to software has been around for quite a long time. I'm not surprised to see the 61%. Um, having said that, I think we should open it up uh, for any questions that the crowd might have. I think we're doing pretty good on time. We haven't yeah. overspoken just yet. Um, yeah, so with that, I think we'll, we'll, we'll throw it back to the crowd for any questions that you guys might have. Well, feel free to, to enter into the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in right before the session. Um, one of them was, are there any Maximo projects where Agile would not be a good fit? Well, I would say kind of a couple of scenarios when you would not want to, when, you know, you wouldn't want to use it. And you guys feel free to chime in on this. but. If I think it's more about the organization and the culture for a project that's, you know, than the project itself. So if you have an organization where you just cannot devote very much time to a project and it's, it's, you have something you can give me an hour a week. We can't, you know, and you're, you're one of my business owners. I can't do it. I can't get enough out of you to make it functional. So if it's a really small business, really, really small where, you know, everybody's wearing multiple hats and there's just no time to, to put towards something like that, then often agile doesn't work quite as well. And you have to go with more of a prescriptive waterfall type approach. Um, also, I think is if you if say you have a, a, a your, your business does all of your testing with testing tools. You, typically, you're not going to set up a testing tool to do such a small right. amount of testing. You're going to, you know, that's going to be for like a big waterfall thing. And maybe if you have users that aren't used to doing testing and that's not something that you would, you know, you would want to do, then to me, that would be two of the scenarios where I would say no. Um, also, if you just, if you don't have a lot of management to support to say no <laughs> to people, sometimes that's where... When you start putting together a sprint and you put five or six enhancements in there and then that list grows to 15, you're built, you know, it, it gets too big. You've got to have you've got to have that executive support to say, no, we need to stop this, put this in and then go into the next sprint. Um, so having that that leadership, you know, voice from the business side, having the time and just the capability and then how your your culture of your organization is set up, I think, would all influence whether or not it was a good a good fit for you. Tony, Carolyn, Lonnie, any, we can add to that one. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Available to uh, get engaged and stay engaged during the, that those iterations that it's not, there's not uh, a lot of, uh, I'll get, you know, kind of, it's on my list of things to do. It's gotta be, it's kind of, it has to be very, I'm sorry, but yeah. it has to be agile. You have to be moving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's no question. I think, you know, you know, I, I spoke on it briefly earlier that it, it's really organization based and it depends on, on your leadership and how they feel about about um, uh, time to delivery uh, in, in certain organizations where I worked. It was, you know, speed for delivery and uh, they dedicated resources, um, dedicating a, a large amount of resources was not an issue. So they did that. And therefore, you could go to the wire agile. Uh, but, you know, to Amy's conversation, to her point. Um, yeah, there, there, there are situations where it just doesn't work right. Uh, components of it would work right, but you, right. It, it, you just can't do it, right? So uh, that's not unusual, uh, especially I think in, in the maximal world, you might find you know some situations where it just doesn't work out too well. So Carolyn and Tony, uh, there was one question I saw um, that it was posted and it was asking, I think Tony, you touched on this earlier, but I just wanna make sure we answered this question. Um, it says, can a hybrid approach be used where maybe initiate and design a waterfall, then build as agile, and then we switch back to hybrid for UAT and training. And then also does waterfall gates, gate reviews kind of get tossed to, you know, tossed in with agile or do they get lost or how does that work? So um, I know Tony, you've, we've all done that, but you want to answer that or-, or Sure. Karen, you sure. Yeah, actually, I, I, it was funny while you were going over yours, I was scrolling through and I saw, I, I saw the question from Ken. Um, and, and, and really, I think that's a great segue from what you just described, right? There are, there are situations, you know, so can a hybrid approach also be, yeah. Uh, the answer is if, you, if you're gonna start off and, and use your, your, your hybrid approach, because in the beginning of the project, you wanna use some waterfall, then for your development, your actual software development, you can do user stories and you wanna do agile, and then you wanna end it 
uh, going through you know UAT and training in a more traditional waterfall that that absolutely works. Um, you know, uh, you know. Also, it says this: do typical waterfall gate reviews get tossed with agile? Uh, it, it, it's what you make it. That's part of the beauty of hybrid, right? At the end of the day, um, I love it because in every scenario that you approach. So, so for example, with, with my university uh, example, there's going to be a very heavy mix of parts, and in knowing my client and knowing what works best for them is exactly the pieces that I'm going to put in place. Now, in in other situations where there was financial check marks that had to happen, so you, you, you had to hit a certain gate in your project before you could get the, the finances to be released from, from said client, well then, obviously, then we're going to have to implement some of those waterfall gates uh, because that, that's what the, you know, the, the, the CIOs, excuse me, the, C, the CEOs uh, and the controllers need. So if, if from a financial perspective, there's expectations, then that's how you're going to do it. And that's why hybrid works so well. Because there are, there are components from each that make a lot of sense for a given situation. Uh, it, it, it's something that I can honestly tell you then I've done some, oh boy, um, I want to say I've done probably less than a dozen pure pure um, agile projects. And I want to say 90%, uh, I'll, I'll go with percentages, but 90% have been a, a hybrid approach. Because at the end of the day, it just it's, it's fit for purpose. Uh, you can right. take those components and really uh -huh. make it work, right? Yep. And and, and, yep. and also the team that you're working with. The team that you're working with may or may not have the ability to provide you with all that time, whether it's on the client side or the development side. So, right. it, you know, you know, it really is fit for purpose. At the end of the day, Ken, it's something that you can apply the pieces that make the most sense for your, for you know, for your group. Yeah, it almost sounds as though the, water, the whole, you know, gate review process, there just may be more of them in a, in a hybrid process. Uh, hybrid and an agile uh project than there would be in a, in a in a large one in other words you just have them more often um to to check off the completion and move on so mm -hmm. yep it can still be there absolutely yeah hopefully that that, that touches on your question uh question can you have any more please you know feel free to type away yep well, one of the things i saw someone else to put out there also carolyn you uh, you can probably answer this i saw um what are some things we need to look out for when we're first attempting Agile? It looks like we've got some newbies that, mm. what are some gotchas they can look out for? There's there's several areas um, of gotchas, but one thing I want to talk about as far as to look for, to concentrate on if, if we're new with the Agile culture and mindset is a positive thing for us to look out for rather than the, what we call the smells of Agile. Um, mm. <laughs> but something positive to to make sure that we start uh, diving deep on and nailing is predictability. And so you'll hear um, us use terminology around velocity of the team and things like that. So one thing to make sure that we look out for to be successful with delivering projects and, and developing software um, is that um, being predictable and providing that cadence um, and being good and consistent with estimating scope and the user stories that Lonnie was talking about. We have to be uh, start really becoming um, experts at those estimates and we have to be uh, very predictable in delivering what we say we're going to deliver. So if we can improve that velocity and it takes a while it's slow um usually the first three or four sprints you're still fine-tuning the velocity of what you can handle and what you can't um and of course that that day is impacted if you have resources that are coming in and out of the team too. I know Tony talked to uh, talked a little bit about resources um but if you if you if if, if all is well and those can be um mitigated that velocity will become solid um, and that's made predictable having that predictability and a, and a cadence like that increases confidence level of the team but also increases the confidence level of your stakeholders that you're delivering to and that is how that collaboration the communication and success really starts taking a hold in an agile climate and culture there are, as far as uh, things to look out for, uh, touched on it just recently, is resources. If you do have resources coming in and out and not being consistent, that, that can alter uh, the, the cadence and, and the delivery and onboarding a new team member, those things like that. Um, not having um, 
uh, people have full time jobs and then they're assigned an, another project and I and do. they're assigned to do <laughs> user acceptance testing and they already have a full time job. That's really difficult to do. So resources and that product owner that can be there uh, full time. Uh, that's critical as well. Um, daily stand-ups, I think, are, are critical as well. So if you do, if people aren't showing up for those, then we, then we need to make sure they buy more comfortable shoes so that they can stand and be in and out 15 minutes. <laughs> in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, <laughs> that's it. Um, and then uh, I know there was a question about um, uh, Scrum of Scrum. So you can have daily stand-ups and then you can have other daily stand-ups with other teams as well if you have external teams. So it's the same processes and principles and practices, just maybe at a, a, a larger level or higher level. Hope that answers it some. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I see one in here. Um... How, how do you determine the effort and what is the scale and how is it relative to hours? So one way to do this, um, especially in the beginning when you're still trying to figure it out, is to go with the number of resources. For example, if you were doing, say, um, an enhancement project where you're going to have a lot of enhancements. Well, the way you can determine how many of them you can do, because even though you've already, say you've already estimated all the enhancements, you know about how many um, you can do. and then you have, you know, the length of time. You don't want to go too long. So, you know, six weeks is stretching it. The six, eight would be probably about the maximum you'd want to go. Um, so you have to look at it from how many development resources do you have? If you have four developers that are, you know, of the same capability to do to do it, you could say, okay, if I have four developers full time and I want this sprint to be six weeks, what can I fit into that window? Or you can take the other approach and say, um, you know, this is how, because you can look at it from the easiest part is estimating how much it's going to take to do each thing just because, you know, we've done it. We know how long it takes to write a report. We know, you know, how long it takes to do a, put a workflow in or make some screen changes. So it's really about how long do you want the sprint to be and how many resources can you put to it from a development side? Right. And so yeah. that's the best way to gauge. And that's when we started, that's kind of what we do. We'd say, okay, we've got, you know, six weeks, three developers. How, the, this is how many hours you get for three developers. You know what? Let, let's go pick which ones you want to get in there, and then, you know, you, that's where you have your planning meetings and decide. Well, if we pick this really big one, then that's only going to give us one or two more to put into it, or we can pick these, you know, twenty-seven because they're all kind of smaller. But that—that's the way I would start, and then after you get into it a little more, you'll learn a cadence with it, and then you can start delivering it. You know more regularly but that's that's the best way to start in my opinion is to go with resources yeah, yeah maybe it's, <laughs> it's kind of, maybe it's kind of also like a uh, a slider right like if you slide the slider uh, from a six-week sprint to a four-week sprint, obviously something has to give, right? Right. So the number of the number of developer hours gets to be less, and so you've got to go back to your uh, wish list and say, well, we have to leave a few behind, and we can only do this many. And then, because it, it really does depend on how soon you want to deliver that value. If if for, if six weeks is too long, and the users are expecting some some good stuff, you know, some low hanging fruit, you know, are they expecting some in, in, in a few weeks, then you do, you just slide that scale and things have right. to adjust. Yeah. yeah. And also you, you want to keep more than just the developers in mind, obviously, because, you know, we could go through a 50 developers at it. It isn't going to matter if you don't have the business side able to keep up with the user stories. You've got to be able to have the people involved testing and, um, you know, meeting with the developers. So the, the point is to keep it smaller. So, you know, two or three developers, then you need, you know, the your respective functional side to, to help out with that. Tony, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? No, that's fine. So yeah, I think one of the good things about it too is once you have that, that initial definition of, uh, uh, let's call it a two week sprint, because now you know your team, you have this many developers, it's been the business side. Now you can apply that and say, okay, well in two weeks, we can get X amount of work done. Then you look at what your requirements list is and you can say, okay, well, this is going to take us uh, 18 sprints. This is going to take us, you know, four sprints because then, then you can really start to gauge and, and, and again, get back to senior management, what to expect and when. So, so, you know, Andrew's question, I think is fantastic because it really is. I think that's where there's, there's some of that gray area. There's so many questions that go into 
how do you determine the effort? How do you determine how many yeah. hours it's going to take? If you have one developer, uh, well, it's going to take quite quite a bit longer. Um, I, you know, I was in a team that we had 55 developers, uh, and we were doing two week sprints, and they were developing and then producing product out for the business team. The business team was dedicated for two weeks after the sprint to test, and then two weeks after that was the next sprint. So we we sat there, we truncated what the work had to be done by sprints and we knew we'd have this many sprints and then eventually we had a cost that we could associate to each sprint for that particular but again it was a very large formula for that particular situation but what's nice about that again is you could really start looking ahead really understanding it better so you gained a lot of confidence after after right. you, once Absolutely. you know what your velocity is you can really gain confidence and yeah. and really keep momentum going and and, and add and subtract as needed uh, Right. And yep. it also helps set expectations, right? Because the planning mm -hmm. process of these sprints, you can actually start announcing, you know, in four weeks, we'll have the purchase requisition process in place. In another four weeks, we'll have, you know, a new work order workflow. In another four weeks, we'll have, so you can start using your change managers and your communication plan to mm -hmm. uh, help users anticipate what's coming and, mar mm -hmm. and, and market that. So um, the planning process is very important. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. The one thing with the planning process, um, I'm sure you guys have all noticed this, you get a more flexibility with prioritization because when you tell someone if you're doing all what these long term waterfall projects that are taking you a year and you're like, well, you're not going to make, you know, you don't, your thing's not going to make the cut. They know they have to wait a year. If they know that, okay, you just have to wait four weeks or you're going to be in sprint three, that at least if you give them a time frame that's doable. And so, I think people are more realistic with their priorities and everything is in the priority one. They understand that, okay, this could be a priority too, because I understand why these have to go right away. And I know that I'll get mine in eight weeks or four weeks or whatever, you know, a couple of sprints down the road. I, it seems like to me that that happens often. No, I actually have a real life story for that. So there's an enhan a client that we were talking on a project recently and, their question was they were just harping on this one particular thing um, over and over again on the various uh, stand up calls. And then I kind of realized why it was happening. And, and so the user was was trying to get this one change in because her comment was, well, I don't want to wait seven years to get it because that's how long oh. it's taken us to get this. Wow. So that is the mentality that some folks have out there that have right. been waiting for good and night and good changes. They, they trying to put everything they can into it because they don't think they'll ever get it if they don't. So right. that's a piece of communication that, that is helpful in these kinds of um, repeat, repeat deliveries. Yes. Oh, seven years. Holy that's God. a long time. <laughs> So it looks like um, we are we have time for, you know, one more question or example. Is there any, anybody have anything they want us to answer before we wrap this up? Are you guys all agile experts now? <laughs> <laughs> At least when your boss walks in the room now and says, I want this to be done in agile, you know what they're talking about. And you can give them a good response, right? And the answer would be, we'll talk about it. It's most likely going to be hybrid. <laughs> and show them the Dilbert comic strip yeah. about Agile. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that might be a good thing, Alex. Do you have that slide handy? We'll show that at the close real quick. Yeah, that's pretty fun. <laughs> it's the good yeah, one. Yeah, this is the perfect, it's the perfect true. example of what Agile is. <laughs> Oops, it's, it seems to be having, it's having a Dilbert moment. It doesn't seem to be loading. <laughs> oh, okay, that's not what Agile is. No. <laughs> it is iterating, but that's not Agile. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, that's all right. We'll 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 send it out. It's a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, if you guys, if you think of any questions that you didn't, um, you didn't hear us go through, or if you, you come up, you know, with something down the road and you have questions, you know, feel free to, Send, shoot us an email, call, call us to get in touch with Starbird, get in touch with us, and, you know, we'll be happy to meet with you guys and talk through this. And Absolutely. I promise you there is probably not a scenario that we haven't seen. So it, it, between all of us and our years of doing this, so uh, feel free to reach out. Good luck with your Maximo. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well,
Thank you all for a fantastic webinar. We sprinted through a lot of great material on Agile, so we appreciate it. And we appreciate all of you in the audience for joining us today. Thank you so much. As, as Amy said, if you have any questions, clearly we have some amazing experts on, on the team here, so feel free to message us. We will send you a copy of the recording so in case you'd like to replay it. Also, if you haven't signed up, we have some great series coming up for future webinars, as well as our 30-minute coffee chat work center series. Series. So we'll send you those links as well. And again, thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.